hardly need to point out that um, much, perhaps most of what we are uh, referring to as sensing with soul, uh, most of the range of um, sensing and perceiving and sensibility that's um, involved in that uh, sensing with soul. Uh, most of that is is really not very usual in our culture, in our time. Uh, it's not those kinds of perceptions, those kinds of openings um, and sensibilities and also the ideas that kind of undergird them and uh, support them uh, and are also involved are, are not um, conventional ones. They're not commonly found in our culture or commonly kind of sanctioned. So that uh, for that reason and for others um, the, the, this sensing with soul that whole the opening of that possibility n- needs um, perhaps for, for many of us, not, not for all of us, but for many of us will need um, a bit more grounding. We, we, we will need to feel that um, it makes sense, that it's grounded, that it's um, uh, legitimized. And even if one is um, very attracted to these practices, and even if one has been practicing them already, there will be... Uh, very often for people uh, a, a, a nagging doubt um, creep in or, or a tendency to want to dismiss at times um, the perceptions, the sensibilities the senses that have opened um, and the experiences there and the whole kind of approach. So um, I feel it, it, it may be valuable perhaps for many and perhaps at different times and not necessarily just at the beginning of one's explorations to kind of see if we can give a bit more ground uh, theoretical ground if you like to what we're doing Um, another way of understanding um, or conceiving of what's needed here is as I've said before to elbow a bit more room to create a bit more space um, to be free to practice in this way um, without being hemmed in, crowded in, um, imprisoned or uh, by the conventional view and the dominant paradigms and something being squashed in that lack of space. So to create a bit more space, to create a bit more, uh, find a bit more ground, to give the whole thing more uh, legitimization um, in one's uh, in one's mind. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, partly uh, um, our freedom to practice this way uh, um, is impinged on, or we don't. We feel a little bit reluctant sometimes. Um, that's because sensing with soul um, opens us. And that can be tricky. It's tricky to be open uh, and opened in different ways. Um, so the the heart is opened or sensing with soul involves an open heart and it may open the heart further. The soul is opened. Um, there are demands of us um, in terms of um, attention, attunement, humility, um, oh, we the sense of self and the sense of world is opened, and there may be uh, a sense of responsibilities that come with all that. So all this it sometimes makes us a little bit ambivalent about um, treading this path, or even in any instance about um, entering into a sensing with soul or opening a certain sensing with soul. Um, partly the demands are, if you like, on, on, on the emotions and the responsibility in the heart and, and the soul in that sense. But partly um, it's also the ambivalence that we have, <coughs> etc., is partly um, 
as a result of ideas. Ideas that we have, that we have um, usually absorbed um, from somewhere or other, uh, a teacher or teachers or teaching or tradition or the wider culture or this or that subculture. And those ideas uh, that we have um, shape our worldview, our Weltanschauung, and our sense of what we are, what life is, um, existence, and all that. And those ideas can either give us um, confidence and um, a sense of legitimacy to this kind of practice, to sensing the soul, and support our freedom to uh, practice that way, to sense with soul, or not. They can undermine our confidence, undermine our sense that this is a legitimate way of um, engaging with uh, the world and with ourselves and with experience, um, uh, a legitimate way of experiencing, etc., uh, and and cramp our, our freedom to uh, the freedom we feel to do so. So, in this talk or group of talks, depending on how you want to count it, um, I'm not sure how many parts there will be. I want to weave a few things together if I can, if that's possible. And one is um, to uh, open up uh, very some very specific practice possibilities that we'll get to um, that, that may then suggest uh, avenues for you or things you can experiment with or kinds of directions. Um, that's one uh, thread th of, of what I want to do in this talk. And a second is actually to look at the place of ideas in in uh, that in those practices uh, that I want to talk about, but also in the larger opening and, as I said, the legitimation, the ground, and the creating space for sensing the soul, so the place of ideas, and weave that together. So I will say something right at the beginning and say it again. I've said uh, uh, many times, and I've uh, written about it, etc. That. Um, Ideas or concepts are present in uh, all and any perception, all and any experience, all and any um, experience of appearances. Ideas and conceptions are present in that. They shape, moreover, they shape our, our perception, our experience. They shape appearances. They limit also um, what... Uh, an, an experience uh, is how, how it is formed, and they're part of the fabrication of all and any perception, experience, and appearance. The um, only experience, in inverted commas, um, that where that is not the case is the uh, is is the, the opening to the unfabricated, and that's a experience that. I'm not even sure we can actually call an experience or a perception. But any and all and any other um, uh, perception, experience, appearances um, uh, in, involve uh, intimately and fundamentally um, all kinds of ideas and conceptions. Now I can just say that and say it kind of emphatically and I'm aware that's how I'm saying it. But if you're not sure about that, um, then investigate, find out. How, how are you going to find out if that's true or not? And one way of finding out is by um, e exploring this double intertwined um, uh, path of exploration with, uh, that, that explores fabrication of perception and ways of looking together. And in the course of doing so, as things begin to unravel, so to speak, or fabricate less, one will see that this is the case. No conception, no perception. No conception, no fabrication of perception. And what we perceive, what the experience is, and what the appearance is at any time, is, is, as I said, shaped, fabricated, limited, constructed um, by, by the idea. Uh, or the ideas, concepts present in consciousness at that time. And one can also experiment as well with entertaining different ideas and uh, concepts and seeing, uh, letting them, uh, entertain them in a way that they're actually translated practically 
uh, in, into ways of looking and then seeing how the ideas are um, form, shape, limited, fabricated, dependent on that conception, in line with that conception, determined by that conception. So any and all uh, experience, uh, any and all appearance, perception, uh, ideas, concepts are present in, in, in a fundamentally uh, formative way. When we come to sensing with soul and imaginally, uh, imaginal perception, um, th- those kinds of sensing, uh, those kinds of experiences and perceptions also include ideas. And they also, as a subset of the kind of ideas, they also include values. And I'll come back to that, the idea of this or that value. The Greek word uh, eidos is, is, is where we get our English word idea. <clears throat> and actually eidos in Greek has a kind of double meaning. Um, it means shape or form or vision or image. And it also means idea, eidos, uh, idea. And the verb form, um, uh, similar in English, um, uh, reflects this kind of double meaning. So um, the verb, verb form in Greek from eidos um, means I see uh, or I know. As we say in English, I see, meaning I understand, not just I see visually, I understand. I understand the idea or I know. I grasp the idea or whatever. So there's a way in particular ideas are uh, central um, aspects that we can kind of tease out or focus in on within uh, Sensing with Soul, and I hope to come back to that. But really what I want to do in this talk, a group of talks, is um, weave together a few things. I want to talk partly about, about the ideas that influence us and influence our perceptions, our, uh, then our experience and our, um, uh, what appears to us um, in our contemporary culture, the ideas in our contemporary culture, you and I um, are influenced by certain ideas and that influences our very experience. So that's one theme. And um, woven in as well, secondly, about ideas specifically in <coughs> or uh, involved with sensing the soul or images or imaginal perception. And that um, that latter thread um, I want to use to uh, open up some meditative possibilities, um, kinds of things that it is possible um, to explore, to experiment, perhaps that will suggest certain experiments or explorations or (coughs) um, practices uh, for you. Um, Among those, uh, some of what I want to at least, at least touch on or, or draw draw, the, draw out the possibility is that it's actually possible um, to meditate on an idea in not in an intellectual sort of thinking way uh, that's possible at all but what I really mean is on if you like the essence of an idea um, and it's a kind of very beautiful and soulful meditation on ideas that I hope to um, outline as a possibility in several different ways um, but more generally, <coughs> um, I want to um, also um, talk about some pr- possibilities in practice, possibilities for imaginal perception, sensing the soul, specific possibilities that might easily be dismissed or closed off to us as possibilities um, because of the ideas that influence us in our contemporary culture or in some subculture that we move in. Um, So partly, as I said, what I want to do is, uh, as I mentioned at the start, is to to help legitimize um, uh, those kinds of sensings with soul, those kinds of practices and directions. Um, And part of that, um, it, it, it will be important to talk about ideas. And ideas includes ideas of ontology, that is, um, what we believe is real and what we believe is not real, ideas about epistemology, how we, uh, what we consider a valid way of knowing, 
things or knowing what is real, cosmology and anthropology, what is the nature of this universe that we find ourselves in and what is the nature of, of a human being. And all of that, interrelated with all of that, is hermeneutics, um, <clears throat> which is really uh, uh, the philosophy of interpretation, if you like. Originally applied to sacred texts, the, 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 the interpretation of the Bible or the interpretation of some other spiritual text and some other tradition. But more widely in philosophy, it's come to mean the interpretation of existence as well. So e- existence, this world, ourselves, if you like, is a kind of text, albeit not necessarily primarily linguistic, um, and we are involved in interpreting that, whether we uh, realize it or want to admit it or not, we are involved in an interpretation of existence or interpretations of existence. So all this sensing with soul has also inter- interwoven with all that and interwoven with all this business about ideas is just generally hermeneutics and what are the possibilities or the um, limitations on our our kind of lived hermeneutics. So of, of tradition and what comes to us through tradition and texts and teachings, but also of existence itself. So... I want to try and and weave those themes together in this talk, or this group of talks. So, to start, uh, I want to try a little bit of a historical perspective. I'm talking about the ideas that influence us. Why? Because uh, that has those ideas have a huge effect on what we consider real, on what we consider knowledge, on our sense of existence of ourselves and of the world, and therefore what's legitimate or not in practice, etc. So, a very brief, um, uh, necessarily oversimplified um, historical perspective. Um, Uh, you could say that um, medieval culture was actually very, in Europe, was actually very sophisticated um, in in many ways, and particularly around religious thought and um, theology, etc. And somehow coming out of those sort of um, intense and brilliant uh, religious and theological kind of debates and writings and thoughts and ponderings, Coming out of that, um, uh, in in a kind of strange way, emerged the scientific revolution and the Renaissance and the Western Enlightenment at a certain point. Actually, it wasn't at a certain point. It was a sort of, um, funnily enough, it was it was a sort of graded transition. The scientific revolution and the Renaissance and all this didn't happen just one day. Um, it's now the Renaissance, or it's now the scientific revolution. Even the ideas that um, were at the um, fundament of the scientific revolution took took several hundred years to really um, for the culture to really digest them fully um, so that it became every uh, so to speak everyone's kind of um, basic point of view um, or at least it heavily influenced everyone's basic point of view um, <clears throat> so I want to draw out three um, st- strands or elements or kind of um, aspects of the um, of, of the classical scientific view, in other words, of the view that emerged with the scientific revolution in Europe in, uh, after the Middle Ages. Um, I want to draw out three, three strands, not, not that these are the only elements or anything, but just for our purposes. One was what emerged, and again, gradually um, it came to dominance, was one aspect um, of the three is a a belief in um, a singular and objective reality. Objective meaning it's it's real, or things are this way, whether or not I choose to believe them, or independent of how I tend to look at them, or what I'm feeling at any time, or what my imagination is doing, um, and all that. So, with with classical science, in time, um, with the scientific revolution, it emerged the sort of 
worldview of classical science, um, which had a view in it, there is one reality, that reality is independent of the way of looking, independent of the mood, independent of my emotions, independent of um, my point of view, um, independent of... uh, independent of, of the observer, basically, independent of the subject, and it's singular, and it's objective, and it's real. A second that emerged with the scientific revolution was what we can call Cartesian dualism. So René Descartes, René Descartes um, divided the world, basically, into res cogitans and res extensa, mind and matter. And they're just very different. There are two different um, things or realities in the world. In a way, um, we'll, we'll come back to this, but there was that, there was that division, uh, a dualism between mind and matter, <clears throat> what we call Cartesian dualism after René Descartes. René Descartes. Um, uh, that's the second. And so singular objective reality Second is a kind of Cartesian dualism between mind and matter. And uh, th- these are interrelating, so you can kind of see the objectivism, the subject and uh, sub- the objectivism of that first uh, element, the singular objective reality, is kind of got a, a link with the distinction between mind and matter, subject and object, to a certain extent. Um, the third, uh, so singular objective reality, Cartesian dualism of mind and matter, and the third um, was a, a little bit, um, let's, say, uh, let's say it grew um, more than was originally intended. So originally with the scientific revolution, the um, intention, the emphasis was to disregard anything that wasn't empirical. In other words, anything that couldn't be um, sensed with the senses or then verified in experiment. And so there's a kind of anti-metaphysical um, trend there. So it started with this um, attention to what could, what was um, visible or sensible, let's put it that way, empirical. But as science developed and discoveries were made um, and theories were made, then um, this kind of uh, there was there was a, a, a growing structure of what was what was in essence behind appearances. So the the empirical sort of emphasis or inclination um, was to pay attention to appearances, what can be sensed. And don't talk about anything if it can't be sent. But as science probed more, it went behind appearances more and more. Um, And so, for example, an electron, (coughs) um, an electron, uh, I mean, atoms were uh, were, uh, an idea that were at some stage behind appearances, but electrons, even now today, are still behind appearances um, in the sense that no one has ever witnessed an electron. An electron is a theory, works very well, actually, there's different theories of the electron, um, quite different theories of the electron, but there are postulated, as as physics in particular developed, um, there was more behind the appearances. Another um, kind of dimension, if you like, that was behind the appearances um, were physical laws. So again, no one has actually um, directly witnessed um, Newton's law of gravity or Maxwell's um, electrodynamic laws or whatever, electromagnetic laws. Um, They are, so to speak, behind appearances. Um, No one sees F equals big G, M1, M2 over R squared, or whatever it is. Um, they, uh, and, and quite different laws, can, like Einstein's uh, law of, uh, of gravity, can be applied behind the appearances to explain the appearances. So in the movement of science, with the progress of science, the initial kind of, quote, anti-metaphysical um, uh, I was going to say crusade, but let's say emphasis, um, 
and the emphasis on um, attention to the to the appearances and the empirical actually opened up more and more behind the appearances. And this behind the appearances was partly what some people at the beginning of the scientific revolution, for instance, um, Bacon and I think Francis Bacon, I think Locke, um, actually wanted to do away with. So, I'll just pause for a sec. So these three elements that I want to draw out, the, the belief um, or the um, uh, assumption positing of a singular objective reality, the Cartesian dualism of mind and matter, and the um, sense of, or the be- inclusion, if you like, of what is actually behind appearances in the form, for instance, of subatomic particles, which are not directly sensible, and physical laws themselves, the laws of physics themselves. And so there was a there was a you know wonderful and, and just just staggering, breathtakingly beautiful um, uh, expansion of scientific knowledge and all the brilliance and creativity there until early in the 20th century and some discoveries were made, some experimental results came out that just called everything into question. The very, very basic fundaments of that classical scientific worldview. And what emerged was relativity and quantum mechanics, and they, they were an absolute revolution. So, um, those three principles were uh, affected. Um, those three elements of the classical scientific view were affected. There was um, a huge shaking up, in fact, complete fracturing or dissolution of the unanimous belief in a singular objective reality. It was found that um, a lot of the properties of um, subatomic particles and fields and waves, etc., were indeterminate. They are indeterminate, excuse me. They, they, um, They weren't this way or that until the observer came into the picture. It was no longer an objective um, uh, reality uh, or singular. So things, until the observer actually made a certain experiment in a certain way, we couldn't say whether what was happening was uh, a wave or a particle or where it was or how fast it was or what its mass was or how big it was. All these really um, fundamental uh, or previously con- conceived uh, as fundamental constituents or aspects of reality being objective and being singular were now called into, um, severely called into question, undermined. So before a certain observation, a thing is said to be in a state of superposition. It's both um, a particle and a wave, and it's neither here nor there, nor this fast, nor that fast, um, nor this mass, or that mass, or that size, or etc. So nor at this time, or at that time, nor um, having uh, a certain energy or not. And some people even now are beginning to question whether things even happen uh, this before that actually applies. In, in other words, um, temporal sequence. So everything gets called into question. Um, <clears throat> and what exists is the state of super, superposition, it's called. Um, kind of wave and particle somehow existing uh, at the same time. Um, a thing being in one state and another state at the same time in some completely illogical manner. Or where a thing is being being a kind of meaningless statement, or how fast it is being a meaningless statement, or how heavy or what energy it has, or whatever, um, and what actually takes the place of um, any um, singular and objective reality is a waveform. Um, so it's as if a, a subatomic particle is actually, so to speak, metaphorically. Uh, before we make a very specific measurement, it's actually, um, before that moment, it's actually, uh, or one can think of it as actually kind of a probability smudge. A probability smudge, so it will, for example, be quite probable that it's here, a little less probable that it's over there, a little even less probable that it's over there, and this is just smudged over an area. 
it doesn't exist in one location. What we have is an equation um, that uh, gives its kind of probability distribution for various kind of really basic um, aspects of reality. Um, I just want to say one more thing here. Um, Heisenberg, who's one of the founders of quantum um, physics, um, published a sort of uh, simple explanation of uh, what was going on here in, for example, his uncertainty principle that talks about this. And um, he made a mistake, he later admitted, because he tried to explain what was happening by the fact that when we look to see where, let's say, an electron is, we look, uh, we need a photon, a, a light particle, to see where the electron is. And in seeing the electron, the photon bounce, bounces off the electron back to our eye, and that's how we gain a sense of its position. But in the photon impacting the electron to then bounce back to our eye, um, it moves the electron. And that is not actually, he later admitted he, he made a mistake in trying to oversimplify it. That's not the basis of quantum physics. Because in that case, it does, it, the electron does have a position. It is a particle located in space. It is here or there, or this velocity or whatever. And what happens is our measurement kind of pushes it this way, but it's still an actual thing. The, um, the uh, more accurate um, explanation of, of uh, quantum physics that Heisenberg posited has nothing to do with that. In itself, so to speak, the electron or subatomic particle does not have any particular velocity, does not have any particular position, etc. It's more just this uh, can be con uh, conceived of as this kind of um, what's called a wave function, a kind of equation that gives this probability smudge over space and time. So, the kind of collapse um, of the, the idea of a singular objective reality was one thing that emerged with quantum physics. A second um, was shaken, but a, 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 a little less so, was the whole um, duality between mind and matter, Cartesian duality. So some people really wanted to hold on to that, some people, as I'll come back to, wanted to move towards everything is just matter, in fact, um, and mind is just matter, really. I'll come back to this. And some people, and the, I don't know if they're a minority, I think, actually um, suggest doing away with um, Cartesian duality between mind and matter and actually developing a physics that includes um, consciousness, etc., uh, so the, let's say, shaking up of the whole, or well, questioning of the whole mind-matter duality thing without any real conclusions yet. Um, but certainly the observer is seems to be involved, and the, the measuring seems to be involved. The observing seems to be uh, involved in a way that uh, is not radically uh, separable from what we then perceive as, as uh, reality. And the third aspect, um, uh, r regarding this behind appearances, then uh, with quantum physics and uh, relativity, then started to get very, very abstract. Um, so the, uh, the laws that governed, and even the um, ideas about subatomic particles and what they were, started to get very... Uh, that, that would kind of explain appearances. So if you like, they're attached to appearances, because an electron is not an electron without the laws that explain it. But I can't see those laws directly. So all this kind of, um, this dimension of what was so-called behind appearances um, became extremely abstract. I mean, so abstract that the human mind can't conceive of it other than in very abstract mathematics. So that probability smudge that I mentioned, um, that's actually uh, uh, an equation in m multiple dimensions, uh, depending on how many particles you have. So it could be in, you know, 14 dimensions or something. Um, 
And when you square the solution of that equation, you get the probability of, uh, of the probability density, so to speak, of this probability smudge at a certain location in a certain time. Really abstract. Or with some of the um, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity about the, 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 the curvature of space and time. This is behind appearances, so to speak. Um, but particularly with quantum physics, there's the the dimension of reality that was um, behind appearances grew larger and larger with physics, and then became more and more abstract. So uh, Wolfgang Pauli was a um, Nobel Prize winner in physics, and um, and he wrote uh, in, a, in a letter to a friend, um, when the layman says, this is from 1948, but he could have written this earlier, um, when the layman says reality, he usually thinks that he is talking about something evident and well known. By contrast, it seems to me that it is the most important and exceedingly difficult task of our time to work out a new idea of reality. He goes on to something we may come back to at the end of this talk, but I'm not sure. Um, so we need to work... Uh, the, the most important and exceedingly difficult task of our time is to work out a new idea of reality. Reality is not um, something evident and, and well-known, he says. What I have in mind concerning such a new idea of reality, he says, is, in provisional terms the idea of the reality of the symbol, the reality of the symbol. So um, this Nobel Prize-winning physicist uh, later in his life was um, a patient of uh, Carl Jung, the uh, analytical psychologist. And uh, only for a short time, and then Jung sort of passed him over to someone else, because Jung was actually very interested in his ideas, in Pauli's ideas, um, regarding uh, the cosmos, regarding mind and matter. And Jung and Pauli had a long and um, very sort of fecund uh, correspondence and kind of friendship, really, um, over some years, and um, developed sort of the elements, let's say, of, of a theory um, which some people uh, call dual aspect monism. And uh, what, what, that, what that really is, is, um, is, again, a singular kind of view of reality. But reality is something that's neither mind nor matter, neither um, psyche nor physis in Greek. Um, where we get the word physics from. So, um, rather, both mind and matter are different um, uh, aspects of an underlying reality that kind of um, coordinate with each other in different ways, and that reality is, um, so to speak, beyond mind or matter. It's neither mind nor matter. It's something that um, mind and matter emerge out of epistemically, meaning in in our consciousness, when we experience, in our knowing, it kind of, this singular, kind of, if you like, kind of transcendent reality uh, that's a, a monistic structure, a, a, a one kind of thing, splits into um, subject, object, mind and matter, etc. So again here, in what Pauli is just hinting at, and what he sort of uh, worked at, there's, there's a behind appearances, there's a singular um, idea. I don't. Uh, it's not so objective because he's tying in the mind and the matter in terms of what gets experienced, and that and that uh, he had to do that because he was at the forefront of the quantum physics revolution. So he could not utterly, completely believe in this um, objective perception of reality. Um, but notice he also said the reality of the symbol, and symbols for him were archetypal, that's where he was interested with Jung and the unconscious and the psyche, and also mathematical symbols. And he did some really interesting uh, work on tracing archetypal ideas um, in the evolution of scientific ideas. 
and particularly with Kepler, a beautiful astronomer, developed um, mathematical theories of astronomy and how driven Kepler was by certain um, religious and archetypal ideas. That actually Kepler discovered his um, theories based on certain archetypal images and um, symbols um, that, uh, that shaped those theories. Anyway, that's a, that's a little bit aside. We may or may not come back to that. But um, the, the, one of the points here is um, what Pauli says about our time. Our time. He's writing in 1948, and now, uh, 70 years later, it's the same. It's still our time. These conundra, the situation of um, what influences us, what, what has evolved in science, but which... Um, no one has really kind of got their head around it. Quantum physics has not really made much, it's made a lot of inroads into technology in our culture, but not a lot of inroads into how people actually conceive existence and how we sense experience. So it's still our time. The sense of reality is still, it, it's the, what were his words again? Um, uh, the, it seems to me that it is the most important and exceedingly difficult task of our time to work out a new idea of reality, and it's still our time. Uh, now, we haven't worked that out in a way that really shapes our perceptions at all. <clears throat> so I want to... Um, highlight and draw attention to and consider um, some of what is our some of our legacies, if you like, or the legacies that we that we inherit, that, as I said, influence our thinking, our beliefs, our assumptions, and our experiences, and then what we kind of dare to do um, uh, in life, and how we relate to life, but also as practitioners. <clears throat> Now, I said this is an oversimplified story, but actually, um, one thing that I think is important to point out or just acknowledge is the legacies that we have are complex and actually contradictory. So, uh, let's let's try and go into this a little bit and um, uh, pull out a few threads here. So, um, I was reading a guy called Christian Fuchs. He's a he's another physicist, contemporary physicist, um, a quantum phys- physicist, and interested in something called quantum Bayesianism. But um, he was discussing uh, Richard Feynman, who I mentioned him uh, the other day. He was another Nobel Physics Prize winner, uh, and. Feynman was once interviewed in, in, he was quite a character, and so some of his interviews are quite famous, and he said something like, you know, if if there was a, a, a massive catastrophe, you know, he was probably thinking of an atomic bomb, um, or atomic warfare, and everything was um, destroyed of, of culture, you know, the one little snippet of wisdom that I would hope survives and that would be the basis to then build everything worldwide, I'm paraphrasing him, um, would be the statement that, the, 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 the nugget of um, knowledge that everything is made of atoms. That is the key hypothesis. So this is what Feynman said. Um, if, once you just pick up that hypothesis, everything else follows. Now, he was more interested in science than anything else, but... Um, Christian Fuchs said, um, or wrote, the problem is the imagery that usually lies behind the phrase everything is made of. So I'm I'm going into all this because I'm I'm really interested in the ideas that influence and limit us and direct and shape our experience, um, both meditatively but also just our life experience. So Fuchs writes, the problem is the imagery that usually lies behind the phrase everything is made of. And he cites William James, the philosopher and psychologist, um, called it, uh, this problem, the great original sin of the rationalistic mind. And then uh, he uh, quotes William James, and it's from William James' uh, book, The Meaning of Truth. And this is William James now, he says, 
Let me give the name of vicious abstractionism. Vicious abstractionism. Let me give the name of vicious abstractionism to a way of using com concepts which may be thus described. We conceive a concrete situation by singling out some salient or important feature in it and classing it under that. Then, instead of adding to its previous characters all the positive consequences which the new way of conceiving it may bring, we proceed to use our concept privately. I think what he really means is singularly. Reducing the originally rich phenomena to the naked phenomenon, to the naked suggestion of that name abstractly taken, treating it as a case of nothing but that concept. That's the key point. Nothing but that concept. And acting as if all the other characters from out of which the concept is abstracted were expunged. Abstraction, functioning in this way, becomes a means of arrest for more than, far more than a means of advance in thought. It's stopping something. It's limiting something. It mutilates things, he continues. It creates difficulties and finds impossibilities. And more than half the trouble that metaphysicians and logicians, um, what I would say human beings, scientists, Buddhists, whatever, give themselves, uh, more than half the trouble that human beings, including scientists and Dharma practitioners, give themselves over the paradoxes and dialectical puddles of puzzles of the universe may, I am convinced, be traced to this relatively simple source. The viciously private, again, maybe it's a historical thing, but I think, I think a word singular would be better. The viciously singular employment of abstract characters and class names is, I am persuaded, one of the great original sins of the rationalistic mind. So, in other words, um, and this is really key, we, Feynman says the key thing is everything is made of atoms. And then, it, and then what creeps in for us is, um, as that view, and that view that emerged with um, the scientific revolution really gained hold, and then the fundamental view, the fundamental take on what is real. What's real? An atom is real. He could have said a subatomic particle is real, getting more, quote, fundamental. Um, everything, I think what he means is if you think everything is made of atoms, then you say, what is an atom? And you'll get beyond what we nowadays call an atom to the fundamental particles. Everything is made of fundamental particles is probably what he wants to say. And then what creeps in as a kind of axiomatic um, uh, dogma of, of our present culture is um, the that, that becomes a dominant view. Everything is really only made of the meaningless movement and combination of um, material particles. So, um, we have here an instance, I think, of um, Jung, Jung describing how, uh, when Jung described how the victor, the victor, and okay, the victor of the scientific worldview over the kind of medieval religious worldview, actually becomes a prisoner, because, and I don't, I don't, this is quite subtle. It's more that um, subtly present, so to speak, in the background of our um, thinking about the world and of our um, opening or closing possibilities for perception and interaction and relationship with the world, um, undermining subtly, subtly present and subtly undermining a kind of ground for um, meaningfulness, for soul and sensing with soul and all that, is this kind of dogma of... Um, uh, of this kind of what William James called the vicious abstractionism of the dogma everything is made of. In other words, it's really, A, the realism, and, and B, the only. It's really only, and only what? Particles. What Feynman really meant to say. Everything is really only meaningless uh, movements and combinations and interactions of uh, of 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 atomic particles
so that whatever we engage in as as human beings and even if it's spiritual work or soul work or psychological work or you know whatever there's there's somehow pervading um in the kind of um <clears throat> groundwater of our mind this oh but it's really only now sometimes that comes to the forefront uh and sometimes for some people it's really at the forefront all the time and others um it's just there in 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 the as i say the groundwater it's in the bedrock and it exerts its influence this vicious abstractionism which is one of the um problems uh, that grew out of the the success of the scientific revolution became scientism it's nothing but that's what the only thing that's real everything is that yeah so hooray for William James to to point out this um, uh, this this vicious abstractionism. I mean, he was actually a scientist. He was he was um, anyway. Uh, it's good that he did that. So, for example, um, I have <coughs> um, someone told me the the other day. Of um, as she told me a while ago of this beautiful, beautiful soul sensing the soul, the soul experience of um, the moon sitting outside on her back step, and uh, some months ago, and the moon, and the full moon, um, suddenly talking to her, and talking to her in a very personal way and with a lot of love, and very kind of dear, and. Um, and she opened to that and went into a whole series of meditations, sensing the soul and relationship with the moon, really um, changing or opening up a lot of perspectives on matter, soul, um, uh, uh, all kinds of things. Um, very moving and very soulful and important for her. Um, n- not at all crazy, um, not at all ungrounded as a human being. Um, she pays her bills. She has um, uh, about as functional relationships as anyone I know, um, uh, etc., etc. Um, and then recently, it uh, again near the full moon, um, and she was somewhere and uh, kind of uh, in 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 sight of and in the sight of the full moon. Um, <clears throat> and similar uh, experience be- or class of experiences began opening up for her in relationship to the moon and that very personal love and personal relationship and the moon actually talking to her personally and loving her personally etc and there, w- there was quite a lot to it which I I, uh, um, I can't go into now what I want to emphasize though is that um the first time somewhat, but the se- the second time, um, she noticed that uh, there was some hesitation, as I alluded to at the beginning, some ambivalence, some slight reluctance to open to this kind of sensing with soul, and some doubt. Now part of it, and she pointed out, was uh, um, actually that it's hard to sustain the kind of um, attentiveness, um, the quality of attentiveness, the um, refinement of sensitivity and the openness um, that's that's kind of sensing with soul demands a lot of the time. It's actually hard. And so we kind of have to be up for it, you know. Um, it also um, demands uh, sometimes in inhabiting a kind of vulnerability. So, uh, and this is related to what I said, uh, the the necessity of the open heart and the humility. Um, Sometimes we need to really sit in, as I pointed out in in some of the talks on this course, um, we really need to connect with what's difficult, um, emotionally or in the heart, and really be in that. and in this case, there was a kind of vulnerability, and she actually had to inhabit it, that's my word, actually inhabit the vulnerability. Now, that's quite hard as well. We have to be up for doing that. Um, and the sensing with soul might open us further. And sometimes when we're open as human beings, we also um, 
assume that open to be open is to be vulnerable because we're not protected, we're not walled off, we're not closed, we don't have a shield. So it was there was some ambivalence because of those reasons. Um, there was also some ambivalence um, because, uh, as she said, um, the kind of um, what she called the current drama, which was actually a situation that needed dealing with um, uh, so much as just a papancha. It wasn't a papancha at all. The current drama, the current um, issues around her and relationship and work that needed to deal with. She said, the sensing with soul, the sensing the moon that way and the relationship with the moon relativized the current drama, relativized um, what else was going on in her life. So, but doesn't relativize it by transcending or ignoring or just kind of being um, flatly disinterested or aloof in some kind of uh, uh, equanimously aloof, aloof kind of equanimous way. Um, but rather, the view is opened and um, <clears throat> the whole sense of existence is opened and what is going on in one's life at any moment is opened. And so it contextualizes what she was calling the current drama or the current um, work and relational situation that she found herself in. And that opening of the view and that contextualizing is also can also feel like a threat because we get used to certain views of existence. And so, whoa, uh, this is only a part of what's going on in a much bigger kind of um, landscape, soulscape, sense of existence, panorama of existence. And that opening can be a threat. But on top of those um, kind of ambivalences or reasons for some ambivalence and some hesitation, there were also, also intellectual doubts that she had. And, and this, this, I think, this is part of what I w- really want to emphasize in this talk. Um, and they are partly epistemological. Okay, This is where it, it comes. So how can I trust this um, experience I have? Um, what gives it any sense of reality or validity? Can I call it a knowing that this, or is it just a kind of weird experience, a kind of strange delusion? She had flu at the time, um, and in the flu, as as you'll know, there's there's the, the you know extreme sort of um, assault on the physical system. There is a kind of feeling of not just physical vulnerability but emotional vulnerability that goes with with that physical vulnerability. Body and mind affect each other, um, and so with with the vulnerability, she thought, uh, I'm creating this, I'm making it, I'm fabricating it in the poor sense of the word fabrication um, uh, because I'm ill and therefore vulnerable and I kind of need it. And knowing a bit of psychology she drew in, this is, this is a kind of early narcissism when the vulnerable young baby thinks um, everything is talking to it and everything is for it, so now I'm perceiving the moon as being personally concerned with me, etc. And I can explain it all away by um, my vulnerability, um, emotional and physical, creating a need um, which um, is the kind of need a uh, sort of regression to the needs and the uh, strategies of of a kind of um, infantile narcissism. Um, so, I want to point out um, what I alluded to, I think, in the Eros Unfettered talks, um, the epistemicide that has... Um, ensued or taken place in the name of the scientific method. In other words, that with the dominance of what we could call modern Western culture, um, uh, the global dominance of that, there is um, both in our place geographically and also in other um, places geographically in the world, there is the insistence um, uh, at, at you know, or at the very least, the, the sort of strong insinuation and um, superciliousness of regarding the scientific, the classical scientific method, um, and its assumptions is the 
only valid way of knowing. It's the only valid epistemology. That combination of um, rationality and empiricism, that particular combination of rationality and empiricism, with all the um, uh, reality assumptions, etc., um, uh, woven in there. So, as I pointed out earlier, what happens then is there is an invalidation in this epistemicide, in this killing off of other kinds of um, epistemology, of other um, uh, possibly valid ways of knowing, other ideas about ways of knowing uh, reality and realities. In this killing off there, in this epistemicide, um, only the scientific method, which means disregarding, um, preferably getting rid of one's emotions um, and one's uh, imagination, um, the invalidation of the emotions and also the imagination in epistemology, in, in what we regard as knowing. So you don't want to be swayed by your emotion. Better that you... Um, uh, kn knowledge is what happens when you have put emotions completely aside, when there is no emotion, or when you kind of discount what emotions uh, are present. Um, contrast that with a possible epistemology which actually um, includes the emotions as... Um, Dif you know, a range of different perspectives or doors, if you like, to reality. So including difficult emotions of vulnerability and grief. These emotions become valid, valuable, valid different lenses or perspectives on reality. Um, they, uh, an emotion like the kind of vulnerability um, my friend was feeling, or like someone else wrote me an email describing very deep grief um, at the uh, death of her mother and another death of uh, someone close, um, and that grief opening up a whole perspective, a whole soul, uh, sensing the soul. Um, could, what, could we have an epistemology that actually includes emotions, including emotions that are vulnerable and grief and, and whatever, as, as valid different lenses or perspectives um, or ways of knowing? In other words, including the emotions in, in possibilities for ways of knowing. Um, they open up our sense of things, our senses, in ways that might not otherwise be possible. Um, so, does that make sense? Yeah? Um, <clears throat> again, talk, talking about the kinds of ideas that have just kind of got into the bedrock of our, uh, our, our psyche conscious and unconscious minds um, and they they really have an influence and an impact in this case doubt or um, a kind of ambivalence or hesitation or reluctance or in some issues in some cases just actually cutting off a certain door or gate or avenue of, of sensing of experience of validation of experience and perception um, but it is complex, I think. Um, as I said, our uh, we receive multiple legacies from our cultural past, and it's complex. So despite this kind of vicious abstractionism sort of lurking in the bedrock of our, uh, of our um, psyche, <clears throat> especially regarding um, matter, um, we, it's also true um, in the complexity of things that we don't, generally speaking, most of us don't completely believe um, that kind of um, uh, what's called scientific materialism or reductionist materialism or physicalism is, is probably a good word, Phys that kind of physicalism. Everything is really only this 
meaningless movement interaction of material particles. <coughs> uh, some people uh, want to kind of go that route. Um, you know, Descartes at the beginning of the scientific revolution started, you could say, with a with a uh, three part. Um, division, not just a two-part a dualism of mind and matter, but also there was God, and so you had God, mind, and matter. Um, it didn't take very long for God uh, to be, actually it was Descartes partly uh, um, was responsible for sort of um, demoting God um, as a sort of uh, he did the creative work and then he just sort of steps back and sort of looks on at the machinery of the universe uh, and the machinations of mind and matter. Um, so God was kind of demoted right at the beginning and then just gradually more so and more so until it was just there was no real need for a view of God, um, it was thought. And so what we want just to have was left with just mind and matter. And then uh, within that, there was, there's even a strong movement, and some people are loudly insistent that actually it's all just matter. So mind is just what's called an epiphenomenon. It's just a kind of um, uh, emergence um, out, out of matter. It's just one of the clever things that, that matter can do is, is be conscious, be cognizant, um, uh, be aware of other matter, um, if you like. Uh, I, oh, I don't think, um, I don't think we live that way. I mean, even the people who really try and push that, um, uh, quite loudly in our, in our culture, um, that kind of uh, radical, uh, physicalism, that that particular vicious abstractionism of, of physicalism, of uh, scientific materialism. I don't think um, even they really live that way. Um, if it were the case, um, this kind of fundamental materialism, scientific materialism, or physicalism, if, if then it would mean that our mind contents are essentially um, matter, their material, what, 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 what um, your happiness or your suffering or your perception of beauty or whatever, or your meaningfulness or your being in love or whatever, um, really they're just certain neurons firing or certain um, uh, chemicals, um, m chem chemical molecules or atoms um, reacting in the brain or electrical impulses, just matter. Essentially, that's that's what they really are. Um, so your falling in love is just the um, movement, yeah. movement of certain particles, uh, material particles, um, and their interaction in, in usually considered in the brain, sometimes um, considered in the whole body. And then you're falling out of love and your suffering there is also just matter, doing different things, um, being in different places or moving in different places or different um, interactions between <coughs> matter and particles in the brain. So in that sense, the, for, the suffering of the falling out of love or the suffering at the um, uh, loss of some beauty or whatever, that's also just illusion. It's just... Um, it's a kind of really what it really is is just um, atoms or particles or molecules moving or combining, um, etc. Um, and that's what the universe is. It's the movement and the co combination interaction of particles. And then, pff, amazingly, leave leave it long enough alone. This kind of um, matter in the universe with the physical laws, and you get amazingly you get. Um, uh, life, and then out of life you get um, uh, the consciousness that goes with some forms of life, and even uh, very uh, um, kind of uh, even more amazing consciousness of human beings. But in a way, what's really just happening is, um, or in essence, uh, what it's just it's just particles moving. 
But, but even the people who push forward such a view um, don't actually live or think that way. They don't run, we don't run our societies that way. We take human suffering very seriously. Uh, we try to, for the most part, um, or some human suffering, to put it that way, in law and in our uh, morality and eth- ethics, etc., um, but <laughs> that view um, it, of kind of radical physicalism or vicious abstractionism that extends to scientific materialism and scientism there um, it, if we take um, if we're going to say well actually we do take suffering see it, uh, as real and, and we take uh, we consider it real as something it's not we don't just regard we don't live in a way that we just regard suffering as just the movement of atoms <coughs> in the brain or whatever and electrical impulses in the brain um, so if suffering um, is real though it's built or fabricated as a kind of mental construct from matter then um So is happiness, and so is beauty. So beauty is in the sense of beauty is in in the beholder, as I say. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's not in the thing itself. And so is love, and so is actually meaningfulness, and so is soulfulness, and so is the sense and perception and the thought and conception of divinity. All these are as real or unreal as suffering or pain, even physical pain. Physical pain is, if you like, mental. A- atoms or particles themselves don't, they, they don't experience hurt. So pain is a mental experience, it's not a physical experience. Emotional pain, definitely, you know, physical pain also. All are um, merely can be regarded. All are, all of these um, are merely um, the movement and interaction of material particles, etc., um, which are not immediately perceived or conceived as such. And and so when we move in the world, we don't um, uh, live in a way that reduces something like suffering or pain to this view of um, uh, radical total physicalism and the vicious abstractionism of that. We don't... But actually, happiness, beauty, love, soulfulness, meaningfulness, and the sense and idea of divinity are all just as much mental constructs as suffering. So you could say, there, if you're going to respect suffering... Um, all these others are equally worthy of um, respect. Or if you're going to disrespect suffering with that, if you're going to really hold to that radical physicalism, then you have to actually disrespect suffering. Or at least a, a lot of suffering. And you have to make a case for uh, respecting certain kinds of suffering. But actually, if, if you just reduce everything to this physicalism, you come, you come back again to a possibility of um, uh, re- you open the door again for, for, for the respectability of um, soul soul qualities and soul experiences all of these are equally worthy of respect or disrespect all have equal value um, so the perception of divinity beauty um even the ideal, the sense of the ideal, idea of beauty and essence that we'll get back to. So all of it, as much as, as pain, as suffering, even as physical pain. So even in that radical view, this, it's complex. We don't actually live that way uh, this, in this vicious abstractionism, but it nags on us. We're, we're pulled in different directions. 
<coughs> there's a, I think he's still alive, a rabbi called Adin Steinsaltz. Uh, he's uh, uh, somewhere in the States, in New Jersey or somewhere. And, um, and he <coughs> points out that, um, you know, as another example of the way we're kind of, uh, we're influenced very much by, by contradictory um, ideas. Uh, and they're, they're part of our sense of existence and right and wrong and value and all kinds of stuff. So it points out that, you know, one of the most obvious things in the world is that um, all human beings are not equal. Um, it's obviously not true that human beings are equal. There's v- vast differences in all kinds of ways um, between um, this human being and that human being better at this, not so good at that, more developed in this, stronger that, whatever. Um, but democracy, he points out, our institution that, that we um, <clears throat> respect so much, although I sometimes wonder now myself, but anyway, um, theoretically at least, um, democracy and the kind of humanism that un- uh, underlies it in- enshrines um, uh, a, a law on the principle that everyone is equal, that the opinion, everyone's opinion is kind of equal. And he said, because it's obvious that um, you just have to look at human beings or, or pay attention to what they do and what they say and how they think and the, their acts and, and what they're capable of, um, it's obvious that humans are not equal. So our, our institution of democracy is kind of um, assumed soul, he, he would say. We're assuming something that we can't directly see that has kind of universal value in everyone. And it's kind of inviolable no matter what the um, apparent differences uh, in uh, human beings, the apparent inequalities between human beings. So again, you get, you get a whole other um, kind of influx into um, our modern world view than this um, vicious abstractionism of scientific materialism or uh, reductionist materialism. It, it could be, I mean, I, I'm not sure um, about what Steinsatz says there, but because it, it, it could be, I, I don't know, um, that our uh, enshrining of a kind of uh, equality between human beings is um, uh, is just kind of silently acknowledging um, our postmodern uncertainty or agnosticism regarding what is of value, um, and we uh, are so confused about values that we can't say um, or or declare, uh, and so we just say. Everyone's equal. Um, I don't know, and there actually there are other there are other ways to look at all that. But um, I think it's an interesting interesting point that Steinsaltz makes, and, and, and po- possibly possibly that really is coming in that sense there um, of of soul that's sort of hiding behind. Um, uh, again, it's kind of worked its way into the bedrock of our worldview. But uh, <clears throat> as I said, it's w- w- we are heirs to um, a complex legacy, a legacy that is a complex of contradictory um, influxes of ideas, and um, and in a way, it's confusing. We are confused. But still, there's a way in which, as I pointed out, I think what Jung said is true of the scientific revolution's way of thought was was a victor um, at that time but the victor slowly becomes the prisoner of the world that it conquered and so for example we find ourselves not entirely free to um, pick up that exploration of the range of possibilities that we call sense with soul because we're a little bit imprisoned, or a lot imprisoned, by these um, 
influxes of ideas that become dominant ideas and become uh, they, they won in the cultural debate, but they, they become uh, we become their prisoner, or it becomes that view becomes imprisoned itself. It can't move out of itself. So ideas, <coughs> um, as I said, shape um, and limit our experience. They shape and limit what we consider. Um, uh, worthy of practice or legitimate practice, they shape and limit our um, perception of self, other, world um, experience. They shape how we sense uh, existence in terms of life and death, and also they shape and limit um, what we do in the world, our acts, and what we devote our energy to and our intention. Now, can you see that this, is, this will still apply in terms of practice, in terms of Dharma practice? So, for example, um, and, and you've heard me allude to several times um, over the years, you, we can get a kind of reductionist Dharma. So oftentimes Abhidhamma teachings are kind of reductionist. They reduce things, again, to kind of atomic units. Um, both matter and mind, uh, atomic units, and then re- these discrete atomic units working in a kind of process. And the practice is shaped in accordance with that idea of what reality is. And so one goes for this kind of micro view that will expose this, uh, that will actually experience this atomic reality, or as close to it as possible. Works to work, work, one works towards experiencing that, and then and then that that whole process, that whole approach, re- reinforces itself. I believe this. I look for that. I believe this. I look in a certain way. I see that. My seeing that confirms my view of it as a reality as a truth, rather than as a perspective. A microscopic view, a narrow focus of awareness, a very sharp uh, attention or mindfulness is a perspective. And that view of atomism is a perspective. It's part of the idea that influences the perception. It's a perspective. It's one perspective among many. Um, Sometimes... um, a person's dharma, dharma practice and understanding and whole trajectory is, is kind of imprisoned in a kind of reductionist view of, of different kinds within the dharma. And perhaps also um, you can uh, be aware of sometimes um, when I refer to the epistemology, the dominant epistemology or the epistemicide that um, uh, does away with uh, or, or disvalues emotions, devalues emotions in in uh, as having a place within, uh, as opening up ways of knowing, as opening up perspectives, and tries or strives even for a kind of emotion-free state. You can also see, witness that in certain kinds of dharma practice very easily. We conceive of um, uh, an ideal state of uh, certain emotions. Um, particularly equanimity, and, and the common view of equanimity is that somehow in equanimity everything's calmed down and we're just really seeing clearly without any distortion of any emotion because we're just really steady. The lake is clear and we can see clearly. Um, or, or, as I said, certain emotions. Or with mindfulness, the idea is, okay, and certain emotion might be there, if I keep practicing mindfulness, actually there's, there's a quietening of the emotional state. But when I'm practicing mindfulness, when I'm mindful, even if an emotion's there, I've kind of got some distance on it so that I'm not so much seeing through the emotion as I'm kind of devaluing what it, I'm kind of devaluing what it tells me about, uh, there's an epistemic devaluing because of the, uh, the kind of... Um, aloofness or distance we have or perspective actually we have on emotions so that can creep in as well so this this um, reductionist view and the kind of atomism there was exactly one of the things that um, 
uh, if you like, Nagarjuna as the, if, if you like, the, the, the father of the Mahayana, um, or one of the fathers of the Mahayana, was exactly what he um, took issue with. And you, you can read his whole um, uh, body of work as really kind of picking holes in that um, r- reductionist uh, dharma, that kind of atomic realist view. Or, uh, again, so I'm talking again about ideas um, uh, that limit our uh, experience. In this case, what, what about Dharma ideas, or the ways that happens, this limitation uh, that comes from certain ideas, uh, happens within a Dharma context. So another one, again, we've touched on it either directly or indirectly, is the absence of the concept of eros and soul-making, the concepts of eros and soul-making. Just even if you just consider the, co- the concept of eros. <coughs> um, and, and the absence of that concept doesn't allow, for me, doesn't allow enough differentiations of desire. It will lead to certain blind spots. It will lead to certain gates closing, uh, not even witnessing, oh, that's a possible gate. Um, it will lead to a certain very tightly circumscribed notion of what um, awakening is or could be. Um, it will lead also to, um, because of the way Eros will stimulate the Eros Psyche Logos dynamic, the soul making dynamic, and that stimulates and stretches and expands and deepens our ideas and perceptions of things in sensing the soul. Um, the absence of eros will also lead to a kind of rigidification and a narrowing, a narrow rigidification of what, for example, matter is. Matter is this. It's the four elements, or whatever. Uh, mind is this. Um, in some uh, view of what mind is, or what mental elements are. Awakening is this. So there isn't, because of the absence of eros, there isn't the possibility for the eros psychologos dynamic to really get going and stretch and expand and add dimensionality and open up the view and open up the ideation, etc. And then um, a further problem uh, or limitation coming from the absence of <coughs> the concept of eros uh, comes from um, for me it's uh, if we don't have the idea of eros then we actually don't have um, an adequate understanding of of our motivation or our desire um, in practice and how it works both what's actually uh, uh, without the concept of eros and soul soul making, we don't have, um, as I said, an adequate or wide enough or rich enough uh, or complete enough um, understanding of uh, what is motivating us. What are we actually desiring when we practice and when we practice consistently and with a lot of love and dedication? Uh, there's not, an, therefore, an adequate understanding or model um, or theory of our motivations and desires as they already exist, as already driving us. Someone who loves practice is already um, in, uh, got eros and, and soul-making involved in that love, in that dedication of practice. As I said, where we love, where we're dedicated, where we're devoted, I don't mean just devoted in a, in a typically religious sense, I mean devoted, just devoted to something, Um, you know, devoted to doing, devoted to practicing, for example, devoted to awareness, whatever it is. Um, Where where there is love, dedication, devotion, um, there is eros and uh, a sense of soulfulness and soul-making in the ways that we would use them. It might be limited, but they're still operating there. So that we don't then, with the absence of the concepts of eros, <clears throat> ideas of eros and soul, we don't actually have an adequate sort of, I don't think, an adequate or rich enough, or complete enough theory of what motivates us, what, what we desire, and how that actually works to um, propel and prolong uh, uh, a life of practice.
All right, I'm going to stop here for today, but I want to continue just on this theme. Um, I'm I'm reluctant to rush through it um, because I think it's so important and um, it's also opening up things from a slightly different perspective than what I've done before. So I'm hoping that not rushing will be more helpful. So let's, let's do the second part of this business about ideas um, in uh, tomorrow. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed,